We're here today to instigate a, a debated discussion among the Conservative Party on monetary policy. So I'm going to take the liberty as chair as kind of laying out for a few minutes the, sit, the current situation. Then I'm going to hand over to, to our amazing panellists and they're all going to deliver some thoughts. And then I'm going to open it up for questions because I'm sure there's a lot of intelligence in the room and ideas on this subject. Um, we've got plenty of food and there's a free bar, so feel free to help yourself. And we're going to be tweeting with the hashtag CPC16. It's rather a noisy person upstairs. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to be here um, for the first time at the Conservative Party conference. After Brexit and following the, the change of leadership, there's clearly uh, an opportunity among all wings of the party for new ideas, particularly on the economy. Uh, and new thinking or rethink on the economy wouldn't be complete without some kind of reimagining of the role of one of, one of the most powerful uh, economic institutions in our country, that is the Bank of England. So the, the bank is possibly its most powerful it's been in history, uh, and its actions have never really been more consequential, yet it remains poorly understood. Uh, at its essence, the bank's role is overseeing how much money is created and where it's allocated in the economy. And in recent years, it's, we've seen a massive growth in money and credit flowing into property and financial markets resulting in an economy that is skewed towards housing bubbles, an oversized financial sector, and most people end up under a mountain of debt. So where are we now? Well, post-Brexit and the economic and political uncertainty that followed, the bank stepped in with a significant response. It announced £70 billion of new quantitative easing programme, so it's creating 70 billion and 60 billion of that will be used to buy government bonds from financial institutions and a further 10 billion will be used to buy corporate bonds. But many economists are pointing to the fact that QE increases inequality and this has actually even been pointed out by Theresa May and George Osborne and the Bank of England's own research has confirmed it. So it's clear that monetary policy has significant political consequences, yet it's not really being scrutinised by Parliament. Uh, and that was seen when there was a debate in the House of Commons on the 15th of September on the effectiveness in, of quantitative easing. And only eight MPs spoke. Steve, of course, was one of them. But our aim at Poster Money is to change that. Um, we've also seen in the last couple of weeks Mark, uh, the announcement of the, uh, from the Bank of England on which private companies they're going to consider buying bonds from. Mark Carney said that they were going to be, they have to be companies that make a material contribution to the UK economy. So it was pretty shocking when the list was revealed and it includes companies such as the, the technology giant AT&T, which are headquartered in Dallas. It includes Apple, which have recently been fined £11 billion um, pounds for uh, illegal tax activities by the EU and other corporations who you could uh, question whether they make a material contribution to the UK economy. Many people have said, uh, questioned whether the bank should be picking and choosing companies like this at all and uh, former MPC, Monetary Policy Committee member David Blanchflower has called it unmandated fiscal policy. But up until now, there's been pretty much a cross-party consensus on monetary policy, which is leave it to the Bank of England. But I think we can see that that, that consensus is breaking. Uh, as I said, many economists are pointing out the QE increases in inequality, and, um, which isn't a good thing. And leading economic commentators such as Martin Wolf have actually said that QE should be abandoned and even pointed to other monetary policy tools that could be more effective and maybe more politically defensible. Uh, some have even suggested a form of monetary financing where the uh, bank would still create money but that would enter the economy through government spending. But either way, I think we can all agree that a discussion about the role of the Bank of England and the Treasury is well overdue and how monetary and fiscal policy can work together. So I'm going to introduce our fantastic panellists. So Steve Baker, MP for Wickham, 
We're really delighted he can join us because he's one of a handful of MPs who have been working, who's been working tirelessly to hold the Bank of England and banks to account. And he also led uh, the, money, the Money Creation and Society debate in November 2014, which was the first debate that Parliament's had on this topic for around 170 years. We're also really pleased to be joined by uh, Peter Lilly, MP for Hitchin and Harpenden. Peter has uh, held a handful of uh, different cabinet posts, including being a former Treasury Minister. And Peter also spoke at the Money Creation and Society debate, where he even mentioned the up to money. Isabella Kaminska is a writer, blogger and commentator at the FT, Financial Times, and the blog FT Alphaville. Um, and having spoken to her, I know that she has an enormous amount of knowledge about monetary policy and the theory of money, so we're really pleased she's here. And Eric Lonergan is a fund manager from m and Investments, and he's also written a book on money and is a writer and blogger on monetary policy, has criticised negative interest rates and promoted the idea of helicopter money. So, first of all, I'd like to hand over to, to Steve if you want to kick off. Although over the last year my career has been defined by the European Union and it's what triggered me to get into politics, actually I'm much more concerned about monetary policy, so thank you for coming. The question is, um, is monetary policy in its current form compatible with creating an economy that works for everyone? And I would say categorically no. No, it is not compatible with an economy that works for everybody. I should just say as an aside, I don't really think this subject's got very much to do with Brexit except for a reason which I'll touch on um, in a moment. I really want to make three points. Very briefly say something about the effects, and then say why don't we tolerate the current system of money, and then ask a couple of questions about what follows. Well, it's now turned out to be quite easy to get the Monetary Policy Committee members to talk about the distribution effects of monetary policy. It was actually very difficult. They'd admitted it in a policy paper, but then you couldn't draw them back to it. I suspect the reason why is that they know it's, a, of course, a political question, how you redistribute a, a wealth, and so they didn't really want to talk about it. But Dr. Vlager came along and uh, very kindly, directly answered a question that I asked him about uh, distributional effects, at which point we are now able to get, to get much more feedback on it. And indeed, at the last MPC hearing, uh, several colleagues held them to account on this issue of distribution. What happens? Asset prices get pumped up by QE, by easy money generally, and of course that benefits the holders. Not only does it benefit the holders at the time, it also, I would suggest, puts people at risk. So Andy Haldane told the Treasury Committee some years ago, after QE had first started, that they created deliberately created the biggest bond market bubble in history. Well, what do bubbles do? They burst. Well, what if we've got a, a bubble in property, in bonds, and in equities? Well, I, I leave that there for the moment. Geographical issues. We talk a lot about the Northern Powerhouse. Well, I think one of the great uh, strengths of positive money for me is we agree on a lot of the diagnosis, although I think we basically disagree about what, what to do about it. But there's something called the Cantillon effect, the idea that money is not in fact neutral. You're not pouring water uh, into a tank, you're pouring black treacle in and therefore it piles up, uh, it piles up before it spreads out. That's a, a short answer to, to what goes on. It takes time for money to change hands. So imagine you've got a great fountain of new money coming up in London and the South East in the financial sector where banks are lending money into existence, where QE takes place, is it any wonder that London and the South East is wealthier than the North? And in fact, there's some charts here, which you're welcome to collect uh, from the front, but I've put together some charts on spending and bot debt and so forth. But on the back uh, is regional house prices. And what you find is that they, the data on regional house prices seems to support the hypothesis that there's a cancel on effect in new money and housing. So I think that uh, ge the geographical ge distribution of wealth is also uh, a function of monetary policy. And a, a, a further point on this, productivity. It's great that we want to talk about the productivity puzzle, but again, is it any wonder, if you're in London and the South East, working in the financial system, that you have to do less effort to make the same amount of money, that you make more money with the same amount? You know, the productivity, I suspect, looks far better in London than our next cities, and that the gap is larger than it is anywhere else, because we have this enormously expansionary monetary system. By the way, when I say ex extraordinarily uh, expansionary, I'm not just talking about QE. 
1997, the UK money supply was £700 billion. Pounds. £700 billion. By 2010, it had reached £2.2 trillion. And if you simply plot the quantity of M4 outstanding, which again you'll find on this sheet, it's an accelerating rush into that crisis. Now, there's a great deal could be said about that, but I've been asked to just stick to five minutes. So why do we tolerate this chronically expansionary monetary system, which we've had since 1971, when uh, finally uh, money was separated from the G word, gold? Well, I think it's really there's two reasons. The first is that, ultimately, currency debasement has always been the last resort of rulers, of politicians, of kings. Back in the days when kings couldn't persuade their subjects to pay the taxes that they wished to raise, they would bring the coins back in, clip them, uh, dilute them and send them back out. But these days, what do we do? We operate a chronically expansionary monetary system, which hardly anyone understands. Which brings me on to economists, because although I'm not an economist, I've worked so often with regulators, with economists and with banks, often enough to know that most economists don't give very much thought to money itself. They just don't. And I've learned by studying monetary theory that actually monetary theory is very poorly understood generally. I also think that there's a profound problem in economics in that e economists think that the methods of the natural, of the, the, the natural sciences, the methods of physics and so on, uh, can be applied to the social sciences. Again, there's a long conversation to be had about that. If Her Majesty the Queen had asked me why did no one see it coming, I would have said, well, some people did see it coming, but there were the economists who focus on a different epistemology, a different theory of knowledge. So, again, there's a, a long conversation there. So what follows? The gr a great advantage of positive money is they've thought about what follows. I would describe such a system as constitutional fiat money. I think you'd probably let me get away with that. A system of money where the government entirely controls how money is created. And that's possibly a system better than the one we currently have, because at least its shortcomings would be manifest before the public instead of money creation being hidden. But personally, I agree with Alan Greenspan and Walter Badger, Friedrich Hayek, uh, and others, that actually what we need is a free banking system, one which does not consist of a central planning committee making grand decisions which steer all of our society. Because one of the great absurdities of the predicament we are in is that people claim we live in a market economy, and yet we all pay huge attention to a massive, big player in our economy and our society, one which is currently, I believe, not only sowing injustice by their actions, but undermining the fundamental basis of trust in the market economy, and that is the Bank of England. Now, they mean well, but I think that it is absolutely wonderful that so many people want to be here to ask these fundamental questions about the nature of money and how it should be reformed. Well, uh, Steve has packed an awful lot of profundity into his five minutes. I should be more mundane. Uh, I, uh, in the early days of um, uh, my political career, was much involved in monetary issues, which then monetarism was the big thing. Uh, and as a result, I'm known as a monetarist, and as a result, I get assailed by everybody, including my wife, on the issue of quantitative easing. They say, you're a monetarist, you're against printing money, Quality, quantitative easing is printing money, therefore you should be against it. And I have to explain that it's not quite as simple as that. I'm against too much money, but I'm also against too little money. Uh, I would also be against too much discretionary control of money, but that's uh, an issue I'm not going to defend. to. Normally, money is created, printed if you wish, by banks lending more than they take back in repayment of loans. And if they do that, there's a net increase in the money supply. And that normally provides enough money for the economy. Sometimes it uh, seems to be getting out of hand. Too much money is created. The banks are creating too much money, and the government, or the monetary authorities, try and limit it by saying, well, you must only have a certain ratio of loans to your fundamental assets and uh, other techniques, or just raising the interest rate and limiting the supply base. Recently, however, since the great financial crisis of 2008, we've had a tendency to produce too little money. Banks have been tending to take back in repayments more than they're issuing out in loans. 
In that case, money is cancelled. There's a reduction in money. QE is just a system of making sure that the money supply expands. Now, maybe that we are having too much QE. You can have too much of a good thing, so you can have too little of a good thing. But I don't think we should get too hung up on QE as such. There will always have to be a system of creating money, whether it be the banks doing it spontaneously by lending more than they're taking back in loans, or in the absence of that, the government creating additional money through quantitative easing. So I don't think we should get too het up on that. Steve is right that the point at which money is injected to the economy will create a sort of, as uh, Hayek used to say, if you put honey or treacle into the economy, there's a mound for a while before it all settles down to an even level. But ultimately it does settle down to an even level. And uh, the reason we have uh, high, high house prices is not because of the money supply. It's because of the shortage of houses. Both. In the long run, it's because of a shortage of houses. You can have a temporary boom in house prices and you can have a subsequent collapse. But ultimately, if you've got more people, you've got 25 million households trying to <coughs> live in 24 million houses, the price of housing has to go up until a million people share homes. It's as simple as that. Whatever system you try to do to rig the price, if you've got fewer houses than households, you will have to have household sharing homes. People have to stay at home with their parents longer, or share with friends, or live in homes of multiple occupation, or whatever. And that's the underlying problem, the worst problem we have in this country, more than all the monetary problems we have. We just haven't built enough houses for the extra people coming into this country over the last 20 years. Uh, and even if we get a grip of our borders, which I hope we will post-Brexit, we will still have to build lots and lots of houses to cope with the ongoing growth of natural growth of the population, the increasingly rich population wanting more housing, and the backlog of it. So we should separate, to some degree, the housing problem from the monetary problem. Finally, uh, monetary policy, to some extent, influences the exchange rate. As a market economist, I sort of like to think the exchange rate ought to find its own natural level. But it's quite clear that we've been running a huge deficit on a balance of payments. That that's normally a symptom the exchange rate's overvalued. How has the exchange rate remained overvalued? Because we've been selling assets to make up the difference. Those assets include IOUs of the government, and they include physical assets. People have been buying up British companies, as we see all the whole time. We call it a foreign direct investment. Of course, it's just simply buying up the ownership of companies. Uh, and that can go on for a while, but eventually you run out of assets. If you sell goods, you can make more goods next year. But you've got a limited number of assets. So we were on a deadline that someday or other the exchange rate was going to collapse. It's fallen happily as a result of Brexit. And I hope it will stay down. To the extent that one has any discretion in monetary policy, I hope we would keep in future to a, a policy that didn't encourage us to balance our payments by selling assets, but had a reasonably competitive exchange rate. Now, I think all those things are slightly off message for the group I'm talking to and on behalf of. So I'll shut up there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Very good. There's quite a few seats here, so if you want to, people that are standing want to grab a chair, you can like take it to wherever you want to sit down. If the panelists have raised their voice, it would help. Okay. Right. Can you hear us at the back? Yeah. Just about. Okay, yeah. we'll raise them. Pass them over to Isabella. Um, hi, everyone. I'll try and speak loudly. Um, I'm very glad that you raised the, the um, the sort of Friedmanite perspective on this, because I think one of the most misquoted quotes in all time is the Friedman quote that goes, um, uh, inflation is everywhere, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, because what's always overlooked is the second part of that um, quotation, which says, in the sense that it cannot occur without a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. So my, my point there really is that we always forget about the output fact, which sort of alludes to the point that you were making, which is that um, if there's a shortage of housing, there will always be a, an inflationary problem. Now, how this fits into the post-Brexit monetary policy world? Well, I work for a blog called FD Alphaville, and we spend a lot of time 
sort of looking into the really geeky parts of monetary policy and, and how central banks work, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing that um, we continuously sort of come up about, or come up against, is the fact that there's a lot of misunderstanding about the very basic concept out there, such as QE. So QE is not actually money printing. It's more, more akin to a, a um, an asset swap. So every time the uh, government is, uh, the Bank of England is creating money here, they're also taking in an opposite equal asset, which in this case is US um, government bills, or will shortly also be corporate debt. Now, uh, this is really important because um, to really understand what's going on and how things went wrong, we have to look, we have to kind of rewind to, the, to what I would say is the 80s and the 90s, which is when um, the digital banking system went live. Um, and really, this is the moment when money started to turn into something completely different um, in so much as we started to think that with information tech, we could have instant settlement all, almost everywhere. So whereas we used to have a system that uh, focused on something called net set, I, I'm using a lot of jargon, so excuse me, but essentially, we created this notion that we can have instant settlement everywhere. And this was a bit of a fallacy, because in reality, what we discovered in 2008 is that instant settlement wasn't really working. There was a massive like mismatch in terms of the liabilities and assets that we, were, that we thought the system had. So we had to collateralize the network, which is where QE came in, which was essentially a re-collateralization of the central bank balance sheet. And this is largely because central bankers have, for a very long time, idealized this notion that zero balances is the idealized form of um, central banking. So you don't actually need to have a central bank with gold or any sort of assets on its books, because the optimum is a zero balance world, where everything squares. So by, you know, as we proceed throughout the day, everybody is um, never owing anyone because everything is instantly settled. But of course, the real world doesn't operate that way. If I order shoes on eBay, my transaction might be settled immediately. But if my shoes don't turn up on time, well, somebody somewhere is bearing that risk. So what looks like on paper an instant settlement turns out to be a non-settlement in reality. And this is where the mismatches come about. So. One of my views is that because of the way we've structured the central banking system, um, we, we don't count the other side of the balance sheet. We don't count the instances of fraud, of, um, of, of all these different liabilities that kind of pop up through the years, because we assume they go away. And when they come to um, a sort of crossing point in, in, in the road, there is only one way you can resolve that, and that is with the government to step in and match the discrepancies that have built up. This is what we saw in 2008. And we now have this system where we are continuously collateralizing and collateralizing, and we're running out of collateral. So my, my key point really is that we're, we're now at a stage where bank reserves are effectively a bit meaningless. Nobody in the international community or in, 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 in global trade really appreciates them as much as they appreciate the collateral that backs those reserves. And we're running out of that collateral. And this is a phenomenon that is now leading to things like negative interest rates and all sorts of other absurd situations where um, a sort of crowding out effect of collateral is um, having all sorts of distortions. Um, I'm probably running out of time, but um, I would just point out that generally speaking, nobody agrees on what money is. It is really hard to define. And, um, but I, I'm predisposed to the idea that money is effectively a sort of a hierarchical system. There is a hierarchy of money everywhere. There, you often hear that, you know, so-and-so has a specific currency, or they've created their, you know, their specific talent has been turned into a currency. Like Kim Kardashian's currency is the fact that if she wears anything immediately, um, you know, it makes money for the people who are advertising on her platform or platforms, whatever. Um, so that's, and we all have the potential to create currency. It's just that not all of us have currency potential that is co um, in common use between all of us. And really, the only common denominator is something like the government, which is why in the hierarchy of money, government kind of sits at the top. So we do kind of live in a free banking world already, because Tesco um, club card points are a type of money. So are British Airways miles. Every single bank that operates out there issues its own money. I mean, 
positive money, positive money's big point here is that. Um, and it's how all these different liabilities interact with each other, which effectively creates this sort of um, complex environment. Well, firstly, so my name is Eric Lonergan. I'm a fund manager at m and Investments, and uh, I'm responsible for money for running uh, global funds. Uh, I work in the city. I, I first of all would like to thank Positive Money for inviting me here today, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I'm very impressed with the turnout for such an arcane issue as uh, the reform of monetary policy. But what, what I would firstly like to do, though, is actually stress why this meeting is extremely important. So I, I don't, and no one should have any doubt that central banks are in a kind of intellectual crisis currently. There is absolutely no doubt about that. So however confident they sound, however good they are at doing press conferences, however poor their forecasting is around Brexit, all of those factors are absolutely secondary to this fundamental point which is, if this economy at any, at any, in the near future experience anything approximating a recession, for whatever reason, there is, with current tools, absolutely nothing that the central bank can do. Now, what's important is, this is the first time in 30 years that you could make that statement. Now, that, that may sound daunting, that may sound complicated. There's a very, very simple reason for that. Right. I'm sure everybody in this room, or many, many of you will even remember, but we'll all be able to identify that for, we started 30 years ago with interest rates close to double-digit levels. Now, what that effectively meant is any time this economy experienced some kind of a shock, so whether it was an oil price shock, a recession in Europe, the banking crisis, ERM, in any of those situations, or just standard cyclical recessions, any of those situations, the Bank of England's starting point was a high level of interest rates, which it could then very aggressively cut interest rates, which provided an immediate stimulus to the economy. Particularly in the UK, where the mortgage system based on variable interest rates meant it was almost an automatic transfer to household cash flows from the Bank of England, immediately induced by a reduction in interest rates. Now, the truth of the matter is, whatever anybody says, and I'll, I'll talk very briefly about what the Bank of England's done post-Brexit, because it makes it crystal clear, they simply do not have tools now to respond in an equivalent fashion. Now, that is an incredibly dangerous state of affairs, because over the last 30 years, we've delegated all authority for dealing with recessions to the central bank and they're currently out of tools, and they're not actually coming up with any good ideas as to how to solve that problem. In fact, by and large, they're ruling out all the good ideas. Right? So this is something that is of grave importance to all of us, and I also think there is an opportunity for the UK to show global leadership and to do some genuine innovation. Now, I, if I can briefly, I'm just gonna clarify how I come to some of those conclusions. Let's look at what the Bank of England has done since Brexit. There's been a reduction in interest rates that nobody in the country has even noticed. Right? There may be some marginal impact on somebody's mortgage somewhere. It's not even clear that mortgage rates have moved. The net effect has actually been a major decline in government bond yields, in gilt, gilt yields. Now, we may not, many of us don't pay any attention to what's happening to the gilt market. The gilt market's extremely important to everybody's pension because it's the discount rate. It's, it's essentially it's the benchmark that the pension industry invests in for people to generate income in the future. So the net effect of what they've done since Brexit is actually to increase people's desired savings. That's a negative for demand in the economy. If you look at what's happening with corporate pensions, people thinking about retirement. So the net effect of monetary policy has actually been to make people more cautious about the future. That's, that's the reality of what's happened. So we, we've reached a point where interest rates are near zero Making interest rates negative is an absurd idea. Further attempts to cut interest, to, cut, to ban currency, these are crazy ideas. People are, the, the private sector is telling the authorities, we have enough debt, thank you very much. We don't want any more. That's part of, we're much more concerned about saving for the future. Okay, so what are we gonna do about this? What's fascinating when you look at central banks is the two fundamental tools of central banks have actually not changed since the first central bank was set up several centuries ago, which was the Swedish Riksbank. It had two tools. It bought government debt, that's actually QE. 
right? So QE is nothing new. It was started 200 years ago with the first central banks, and they provided liquidity and a financial panic to the banking sector. We've delegated banks authorities for managing the whole economy with two tools that are unchanged in 200 years. So what I would at least like us to do is start an intelligent discussion about how we are going to reform the Bank of England and give it tools that are effective. Now, the objective of that discussion has to be preserve the central bank's independence. Right? We do not want to revert to the old policies where you get a big boom bust associated with the political business cycle. So we, whether or not we like the politicians, we don't really want to give the politicians cyclical control over monetary policy. Preserve the Bank of England. We want to maintain the inflation target because that price stability is undoubtedly a very, very good thing for an economy and a society. And we want the policies to be effective and as fair as possible. And one of the suggestions out there, that, which I think is worthy of, of consideration, don't believe me as a fund manager based in the city. We have people as, it was something that Keynes, Friedman, Ben Bernanke agree on, which is actually in a recession, and I thought Peter put it beautifully, you can have too much money, you've got inflation. It's not difficult to know whether there's too much money. If you've got inflation, there's too much. If you have the threat of deflation, there's too little. So there's an awful lot to be said for a very simple policy solution if there's the threat of deflation, were this economy to slow very, very seriously, which is allow the Bank of England to make transfers to households. So instead of forcing individuals to do things that they don't want to do, i.e. to borrow more, why not use the money that the government can effectively generate to counter recessions to make an equal distribution to households? Now, obviously, that is no small challenge. It would require legislation. But really what I'm saying is I really want to stress one point, which is currently we don't have the policies. The policies that are being pursued are outright dangerous and extremely risky. This requires some new thinking. We need to start that thinking right now. got a lot of questions for the panel but I will open it up to the floor to start with and take three. So the person with the green t-shirt. Yeah I'd like to point out that in 1925 C.H. Douglas with the social credit because workers are producing goods and services and the prices for those goods and services are always going to be higher than the incomes that they receive. So there's always going to be a discrepancy in monetary policy, even at that level. So as the gentleman was saying, his solution was national dividend payments in order to counteract that <coughs> the difference between the prices and the income. So that's an interesting point of view that he raised there as a possible means of reform. Is there a question? Or just a statement. I just wanted to highlight yeah. that social right. credit okay. theory. Um, so, yeah, and please keep your, raise your voices and keep your questions <coughs> concise. So, check, share. Um, hi. So, it was very interesting. Thank you to all the speakers. I have a question to the, to the lady from the press. I uh, read a lot of economics. I, I read papers even from central banks. But I didn't understand a word of what you said, so I was wondering if you could <laughs> maybe try and explain your your thesis to a normal normal people language. That would be thankful. Thank you. Uh, we we heard that uh, central banks use monetary policy to a keep out the hands of politicians and out of the boom uh, the electoral cycle, and b to maintain price stability. Uh, but the price stability that they didn't maintain deliberately ignored housing prices. They were told CPI, not RPI. Does the panel think that A, damaged what they were trying to do, and B, led to politicians being able to ignore what the housing price, the housing market should have looked like had that not been the case? Okay, yeah, sure. Start with you and then move So um, the major Douglas thing. Um, there's a rate, there are so many ideas in monetary policy. Sometimes he's denounced as a crank and sometimes he's admired, and I don't know. I just use it as an opportunity to make the point that there's a very wide range of views around monetary theory. It's one of the things that makes it difficult to determine what we should do next. 
Um, I would say I, I thought I understood most of what was said and found it very interesting, but I hope you'll forgive me for disagreeing. Um, you project your voice, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, <coughs> it's actually quite difficult <laughs> to talk this loud, but we'll try. Um, on that other point about deliberately ignoring the price of houses, yes, you're absolutely right. Peter made the point about supply and demand. I'm not denying supply and demand, but I think both supply and demand and the way that money injections happen are both relevant. But I won't say any more about that. But I tried, to, during the last Parliament, I tried to get the government to talk about this issue of ignoring house prices. They decided to introduce what they called CPI brackets H, but it only, it only looks at your mortgage costs or your rental costs. It doesn't look at actually the asset price. So there's all sorts of things going on, on here which obscure the, what, for me, are the fundamental issues. I will try. Um, I mean, I think that speaks more about my presentation skills than anything else. Um, so it is, it's a really complex situation because there are so many moving parts. But if there's one point I'm trying to make is that money is something endogenous. It is an ethereal concept and a lot of us um, <clears throat> think we know what it is, but in reality um, nobody can really agree on it. And there is no such thing as money um, you know, this is, you know, I know you think of like a five pound note being the definition of money, but when you look at the big picture and you unpick everything, you realize that money is this hierarchical situation of all sorts of different liabilities, i.e. I owe this person this and I owe that person that. And banks have liabilities, we have personal liabilities, um, then there's like other types of money, there's commodity money, there's coupons that are issued by supermarkets. There's all these different things that float around in the world that qualify as money. So when you take policy and you address only that top little sector of money, there will be distortions because you're not necessarily addressing the rest of the mon monetary universe. And just because this is positive money, I think um, you know, their big revelation was that banks create money without any sort of... Um, governmental supervision. It's up to them how much they issue, right? Nobody tells them um, you can issue a million or two million. or two. They do it. And what determines whether they do it is the potential productivity of the loans they are making. And if, if the universe of money works, then everything should balance to zero plus create some profit. Okay, but somewhere in the system, we went wrong. These balances, did they stopped balancing. And so we ended up with a big deficit. Now, was it because the banks were over-issuing money to the point where, you know, banks stopped being the, you know, if, 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 I mean, if you really think about it, what is a bank? It is in the job of creating barriers to entry. It's a wealth rationing system. It is a, um, you know, it is in the job of ensuring money is always scarce because if money was literally falling from the trees, there would be no point to money. So as soon as banks end up kind of like, you know, I don't want to call them the mafia, but like say they, they're, they're internally corrupt and they start issuing money as if it comes from trees, you create a problem. And this can happen all over the place. I mean, it can happen to supermarkets, which are over-issue units, um, like club card points. I don't want to mention any specific supermarkets, but like hypothetically, if you over-issue club card points, you have a run on your, on your supply. So it can happen to anyone. This happened in Weimar, et cetera, et cetera. So the solutions have to understand that the system of money is complex. And if you address just one specific type of money, you're probably going to create unintended consequences somewhere else in the chain. Does that make more sense? Yes. Yeah. OK. It's a complicated topic. Would either of you like to comment on any of those questions? The uh, housing price, social theory, finance? No? I'd just make a very brief comment I, I, on the absolutely, yeah, there's a, a, a long history of ideas along these lines. Um, I think the housing point is a very important one. I think I would make a very simple observation, which is, is excessive reliance on interest rates. Um, yeah, so the parts of the economy that are more sensitive to interest rates are going to react an awful lot more. So what we're discovering is that inter interest rates are a very blunt, um, and their effects are, are ambiguous and can be destructive. And, you, and, and it's entirely valid if you look at places like Scandinavia where they're now using negative interest rates, for example in Sweden, it's causing huge problems, as you would absolutely expect in the housing market with a, a huge housing bubble and financial stability. So we really do need to think about alternative ways of, of creating money and, and stabilizing demand in the economy. Great. Any questions? Okay, 
let's take three more. Um, so blue tie. Okay, um, I'm just wondering that no, how, ch how has China affected things? Uh, check shirt. Check shirt. Dick Rogers, a fan of positive money, but I might not completely have understood what positive money is saying. But uh, in the book, in one of your books, you quote uh, early American president uh, Thomas Jefferson, who I think I've got it right, said that the power, that the sovereign authority to create money should be taken from the banks and returned to the people to whom it properly belongs. And it seems to me that the essential deficit is that the money stock of our country is almost entirely, apart from the 3% that's cash, is the, is, is, is the property not of the nation, of the society, but a debt by society to its creators and lenders, the commercial banks who are not part of our society, really. Uh, and, and they should actually be banned from creating money and an agent of society, namely the Bank of England as a public servant, should be given that job and should do it. Uh, have I got it right? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I might rephrase it, um, but I'll take one more question and then I'll, and then I'll do that. Um, so, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, um, you said, um, Eric, that um, the monetary, Bank of England's monetary policy on interest rates has failed. Um, which clearly has because we haven't had any increased demand. But actually, isn't it more of a failure because interest rates for small businesses are still at probably 14 to 20 percent, consumer credit is probably APR 30 percent, and most mortgages are still at 45 percent. So actually, they say they've done the policy, but it hasn't gone through at all. They keep saying it's going to fall. So before you look at anything else, shouldn't you see up their ways that they can fall through? Great. So the questions were, what about China? And then Dick very eloquently outlined Positive Money's proposal, which is around um, stopping banks having the power to create money and returning it to the state. But I'm feeling like that's quite controversial amongst our panelists. I'm also going to throw in our campaign, which we're doing at the moment, which is the fact that QE is money created by Bank of England. Uh, kind of disagree with Isabella that it's not creation of money, because it is creation of central bank reserves which are then swapped for assets. If we're going to create money in the public interest, how do we get that into the real economy so that it benefits people and households? But I'd very much welcome comments on our main proposal which is the more radical uh, stop, stop money being a, a debt by society to commercial banks. And then the final question was about interest how these low interest rates just haven't penetrated, like haven't gone through to SMEs, mortgage, even mortgages. So who wants to kick off? Big questions. Thanks. Actually, I meant to say previously, I'll start answering the last set of questions again. Now, one, one thing I would say about it, if you didn't understand what Isabella says, you should read her work because uh, it's very clear and very brilliant and very interesting. So I would, I would strongly recommend that. Um, with respect to interest rates not being fed through, I mean, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I still, though, would suggest that what we're realizing about central banking is that interest rates as a tool has reached the end of the road. Um, but, and, and, and my own personal view would be that we should let competition and efficiencies and technology in the private sector, which I think is happening, reduce the cost of credit where it's appropriate for it to be done. But I still think the essential point is there's an over-reliance, really, on interest rates. I mean, with respect to China, all I would say about China is a fascinating subject. I don't think it's too directly relevant to this conversation, um, except for perhaps this, that China similarly has a problem of too much debt. Right? So, so this is a global phenomenon that the private sector pretty much globally is, perceives itself to be overburdened by leverage. So we should watch China because the one good thing about the Chinese is they think very independently and they're not shy of the unconventional. So um, even if it isn't the UK that can lead the way on this globally, and as I say, there is a real opportunity here, it may well be that it comes from somewhere that we don't anticipate and they are gonna innovate in a way that we can learn from. So we should certainly watch the Chinese situation very closely. Can I come in on China? Yeah. Interest rates normally have to do two things. 
they have to produce a balance between people's desire to hold money rather than their desire to hold interest-bearing assets. And they have to balance the uh, desire to save against the desire to invest. So they have to simultaneously do both things, which is quite difficult. Uh, but it normally sort of happens and works its way out. It's more difficult when interest rates can't go down below a certain level. China, however, has a chronic propensity to save. It's very odd to me that a poor country, well, it's relative to us, it's, or our standards of living, people want to save so much. And even though they invest a lot, they have a propensity to save even more. So there's a sort of glut of savings in the world from China, also to some extent from Japan and Germany. Uh, and that uh, ideally, therefore, should be borrowed and result in extra investment elsewhere. But the interest rate ought to help bring that about. Uh, it isn't bringing that about. Well, uh, automatically, these things uh, are identical. But it's uh, tending not to happen as smoothly as it should. And if anything, it's happening by reducing the level of activity rather than increasing the level of investment. So uh, somehow we want to overcome that. Uh, I, we had calls for new thinking. Uh, I hope by before the end of the, uh, this session we'll have got that new thinking, we worked out how to do it. I don't know how to do it. But that's the problem, that China saves too much, uh, even though they you'd have thought they've got plenty of things to spend the money on and consumer goods. But, uh, just to add on the China point, I would recommend a book called Paper Promises, Money, Debt and the New World Order, which, <clears throat> despite its provocative title, is written by the Economist Capital Markets editor, Philip Coggan, and he discusses China in quite some uh, detail, so I would recommend that one. Um, I think China's probably got the same problem as everywhere else. If there's something wrong with the fundamental way that the institutions of money are set up, then it's the same institutional problems afflict China as well. On this point about money as an obligation to the banks, um, <coughs> there's a, always a risk of going off uh, on a tangent. There's basically two things you could do in a reform about it. You could do what basically Irving Fisher said, have paper money 100% backed, the banks don't create uh, 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 any money as debt, um, and, uh, and your ultimate settlement is basically paper money. Uh, that would be a way of doing it. The other way, which historically has been the way of doing it, is gold. And gold is the, has the great advantage of you're able to take possession of that physical asset and it's nobody else's liability. And so gold is the other way. If you look at a great, a great reading on this is Alan Greenspan's essay, uh, Gold and Economic Freedom. It is the, to me, it's the absolutely definitive short essay on a system of free banking based on redemption in gold. Uh, he wrote it back in the 60s. Ron Paul asked him if he repudiated it. He said he never had. Um, I hoped to meet him last year, the year before, and ask him again, but uh, unfortunately he was frightened off him from attending that particular conference. That's another story for another day. But, um, you know, that, that is the book to read. Personally, I think the thing to do these days is to let the market work. What you do is you remove all... Re I would remove all restraints on producing uh, uh, money in the private sector. So Bitcoin would be one example. Other uh, ways you could do it would be um, to have use fintech to have claims on gold and silver. But I would take the state out of the way of um, uh, the innovators, entrepreneurs, creating new forms of money uh, that were not claims on uh, uh, claims uh, liabilities to the banks. Very quickly, I'll, I'd just add that the hard thing isn't issuing money. Anyone can issue money. The hard thing is getting other people to accept your money, right? Um, and so all this sort of innovation, that sounds very promising uh, on, on the surface of things, but I will also remind people that, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention and there's sometimes no, no more desperate people out there than criminals and the um, sort of black economy. They, they are very good at innovating on, uh, on all this stuff. And again, I mentioned the mafia, but um, they've been innovating, creating new sorts of money for, for many generations so the art market is a good example of a sort of parallel money system that's been operating um, sort of alongside the legitimate one all, all this time so um, with respect to China the same the same applies China has just joined something called the special drawing right basket I don't know how many of you are familiar with that but it's essentially the IMF basket for um, valuing their special drawing rights 
And uh, this was made, this was a really big deal because it sort of means China is now one of the big boys. It's, it, it's issuing so-called hard currency and hard currency is supposed to be something that is internationally accepted and qualifies as, as something everybody wants to keep in their reserves. Um, but the truth is, when you speak to um, the market, um, it's not clear at all whether just being in the club means that the market will accept these liabilities because there's more to, um, to what a liability, an acceptable liability is than just being part of a basket. It's whether or not your system of law is trustworthy, whether you're likely to default on you know, promises, whether your business practices are um, solid, whether your property right law is um, acceptable. And people are not yet convinced that China necessarily has this, the same standards as the West. So it'll be a very interesting time to see uh, whether or not the market goes for it. If they do, then um, you know, there is potentially a big transfer of, of power coming up. And then really we won't be worrying about whether the Bank of England is producing mon money or not. We will be worried, about, or not even the BOE, that, that hasn't been the case since like before the war. Um, more like the Federal Reserve. Then we will be worrying about the PBOC. But for now, it doesn't look like um, that's going to happen because we still don't necessarily trust China the same way that we do trust the, the US. Just the, 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 the SME interest one? rates and the positive money is doing QE differently. We can come back come to that maybe. Let's take up another round of questions. And then we I was fascinated, uh, Nigel Martin is my name, um, I was fascinated that um, when Iceland beat England, 10% of the population had travelled from Iceland to Nice, or wherever it was. And I thought, how could they, how could such a large proportion of the population afford to go to Iceland, uh, to, to, to France, when they suffered a worse financial crisis than we did in 2008. What did they do that we haven't done? Oh, yeah. Is there something missing from this in terms of you outlining positive news position a bit more explicitly? And would you see a role for credit unions in the facilitation of um, moving that money around the country? With reference to Reuters, the uh, share price of Deutsche Bank has uh, fallen yet again. So my question is, how big a problem is this, and how worried should, should we be? Okay. Um, is it? Oh, maybe I'll take one more because they're quite short questions. Uh, Brent Tide. Why do you think it is that when there's a House of Commons debate about France to be the only like a dozen MPs turn up? these four and you'll be in the next round, okay? Don't panic. So Iceland, why can everyone still afford to go to Nice? Um, what do we think about credit unions as part of the solution? Um, Deutsche Bank's just had a massive share price crash. How does this feed into the broken monetary policy system? And um, why do only a handful of MPs turn up to any debate on monetary policy? Is this a problem? Who wants to kick off? Yeah? Yeah. I mean, well, I don't, I don't know the, the complete detail about what happened in Iceland, but, but I think I, I, we can make this a very complicated discussion. We can keep the question of money actually extremely simple as well. Uh, the great Scottish philosopher, political economist David Hume, said that there were three spontaneous institutions of social organisation, so three institutions that all societies have, which is language, law, um, the rule of law, and money. Um, and, and, and in many ways, those are three amazing free gifts that a civilized society has. Right? Language, which is the most valuable thing that we have, is free. The rule of law isn't quite free. I and mean, these may well be you know, uh, hard-fought wonderful things. But essentially, the benefits of the rule of law are available to all. And that is an amazing fact that society has. The ability to print money used wisely is in, is in large part the basis of an advanced economy. Right? So it, and and it, is, it is free. 
money is created out of nothing, and as people have suggested, it just depends on trust. So I do believe that also because it, it tends towards being a monopoly, what really all of that means is if, if, if loads of people set up their own monies, we will end up after a certain amount of time with one. That's why it ends up in the state's hands. So even if, if you think ideologically, Milton Friedman believed the state should produce money, and he was a, 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 obviously an advocate of free markets, but there's an inevitability, which is you end up with one money because of, 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 of the economies of scale, because it's, it's most convenient if we have one. So the most, in a sense, authoritative issue will dominate. But the Iceland point is important. No society should be brought to its knees by a financial crisis. If you are, it's a failure of your monetary authorities. In the same way, as Peter said, no civilized society should have deflation, because it can create money for nothing. The challenge is to make sure that people get the money and that it's being created responsibly. That is, it's as simple as that. So when people talk about hyperinflation, etc., those are the institutional failures. Right? Any, you know, you, a, a corrupt dictator can destroy a society. It can destroy the rule of law. But that is not a reason for us to distribute money in an intelligent way. And I'm actually suggesting a very simple solution here. For a fraction of the amount of money that would be used with quantitative easing, three or four percent of GDP, just give the Bank of England the ability to cre credit people's households directly with money. You don't need any spectacular innovations, you don't, there's no political vested interest that should be opposed to that. And, and a final point, why does nobody show up for a quantitative easing debate? Because people are absolutely baffled and embarrassed to confess that they have no understanding of how the entire thing is operating, nor what its effects are. Now, to the gentleman at the back, I think these issues can be explained very clearly. The problem is, if you explain quantitative easing very clearly, you realize very quickly it has virtually no effect. Mm -hmm. Could I, I yeah. on, on this? Uh, and leading back to the issue of helicopter money or the Bank of England crediting everybody, I am the recipient of helicopter money. The government pays me my MP salary of £70,000 a year. I pay tax of perhaps half that amount. So I'm, the government is somehow getting the money to give me that extra from somewhere. Like so it's getting it from other people. But over the economy as a whole, the government is spending roughly £100 billion more than it's raising in taxation. So it is injecting into people's pockets £100 billion a year. What it does is says, well, that's creating an extra £100 billion of money. That's too much, so we'll, uh, we'll scoop some back by selling bonds to get back from the banks the money that they have created and put into circulation. So I don't really see any difference between uh, the so-called helicopter money and what we have at present. Am I missing something? Can I just say, well, there's okay, one very yeah, obvious yeah, yeah. difference, which is... The system as it is, it's doomed from the start because of the interest. And because the, the bank down to keeps all the interest they make on the money. <coughs> the system with sovereign money, it's money is created with no interest. So it, it all, it, it all fits in a nice, nice system. Do you want to quite very, very quickly come up on that? Yeah, I'll just make the very simple point. I, I think to some, to some extent, uh, Peter is correct. So it, effectively, fiscal policy could do the same thing. But I just have a very practical observation. Let's say there's a nuclear accident or there's a financial crisis or Deutsche Bank collapse, something happens externally that causes this economy to go into recession, what is the Bank of England going to do next week? The reality is absolutely nothing. So we're going to have to be, we're, we're, we're entirely in the hands of fiscal authorities. And all I'm saying is let's just give them a simple effective tool that is not particularly dramatic, is not really that dramatic an innovation, but means if this economy does at any point in the next five years go into recession, they have the ability to end that recession quickly. Do you want to come in on why no MPs turn out for debates? Yeah, well, it's a bit like what Eric said. Why, well, put it another way around. Why do MPs go to debates? There's basically three reasons. Constituency pressure. It's entirely proper. Their electors want them to go and attend a debate on an issue. Secondly, because they personally appreciate that the issue is relevant in the common good or you know, for, to their electors, but they're not under pressure, but they care about it, which would be why I go. And the third reason would be because the whips tell them to go in the interest of supporting the Prime Minister or whatever. And on this issue, I think the bottom line is, basically, to put what Eric said maybe just a tiny bit kind, more kindly, they just don't know about the issue, and therefore they've got nothing to say. Zach, Zach Goldsmith wouldn't mind me saying that, though he spoke in the Money Creation and Society debate, he confessed he didn't know 
very much about it, but he sort of sensed it really mattered. And this is a lot of this is going on, you know. Maybe we're all crazy and everything is going to be fine and they'll just do a bit more QE and half percent interest rates, the economy will restart, there's no problem. I don't think that's right. But if we are in one... It, insofar as there is an intersection amongst our views here, we all seem to think that there's something quite wrong with the monetary system. Well, OK, if we're right, we'd better start getting all of our brains on this and try and work out what we're going to do. But I'm afraid, because it hasn't been an issue, members of Parliament aren't equipped. If I may, I just on this point of Deutsche Bank, and then I ought to say something about positive money. I think with both Deutsche Bank and the Italian banks, there's a whole set of institutional failures, just setting aside the money things. The limited liability corporate form, as opposed to unlimited li strict liability partnerships, means that the people operating the banks don't stand to lose massively when it all goes wrong. That's something I raised in another um, uh, uh, in a bill. And the other thing, the IFRS accounting system causes you to pro-cyclically overvalue assets and, and, and under account for loan losses. And I think that's also made all of the banks much more vulnerable. I personally do expect a massive banking crisis because I believe that monetary policy has overinflated uh, the numeric uh, value of, uh, of assets. Um, on positive money, you know, the bottom line is I don't support these ideas about helicopter money and, and money creation in, in these ways. But to, to give a refutation of it now, I feel would be trespassing too much on, other, on all of your time. But I think in the end, money has to be something which is not created and handed out by, by government. I think one way or another, you, you simply cannot trust politicians, in ultimately politicians with the power to create money. And I know Eric said the Bank of England needs to be independent. Of course, I respect what you said. But I, I think that once, you were to, once one were to start down this, and it would become very clear that um, this redistributional effect was political. I, I think that resisting uh, calls for much more democratic control of the currency creation process would be, uh, be impossible to resist. So I'll just say very quickly that um, I totally agree with Eric that money tends towards monopoly. And this is one of the issues when you face something like the free banking uh, model is that you will inevitably end up with a cartel because it's like OPEC. You have to control the supply if you're going to retain the value. This is why Bitcoin has a very um, hardwired sort of scarcity factor inbuilt in it. From, you know, full reserve money, I would just say this too has problems because you don't want to end up in the sort of Goss Bank world, which is the Soviet system where the central bank was in charge of the entire money supply in terms of how the transfers were being done, who who got allocated the money and how much, and we're kind of veering towards that world already with with this new um, Mark Carney um, idea to kind of buy corporate bonds because he's already making decisions about what what sorts of corporations will be given this sort of advantage, whereas which uh, versus those that won't. These are um, market-based decisions, I would argue. So it's, it is a bit unnerving to see a, um, an institution like Bank of England making these qualitative cho uh, choices. Um, but I'd also argue that we, you know, the best way to think of banking and money is as the original sharing economy. We hear a lot about the sharing economy these days. Um, and we hear about how it's network-based. Well, before you had Uber or before you had Airbnb, you had money, and money was literally a network system. And if you all had the Uber of money, AKA the pound, you had certain frictionless sort of ease of access situations. And this is what created what um, people called, well, there are two types of money. It's uh, information sensitive and information insensitive uh, money. So the sort of stuff that we all know and we can all trust because we know the brand, we know the person, we don't have to do much due diligence on it. We, can, we just know who it is. If, if there's a problem, we can go collectively and uh, get our money back, so to speak. But all the private money has an enormous um, information asymmetry associated with it, and the cost of doing the due diligence defies the network effects that you get from it. And that's the problem, which is why I advocate balance. So you don't have entirely full reserve, and you don't have entirely private, but you have a nice balance and the two keep each other in check. Thank you. Okay, we're just going to take a few questions about distribution and it's leaking down and the idea of
credit unions. Uh, can we going to pick up credit unions all very quickly, please? I just would make the observation that credit unions, uh, like peer-to-peer -peer lending generally, don't have this credit expansion phenomenon. And it's quite interesting with the growth of peer-to-peer -peer and interesting credit unions that actually that the nature of money creation would change naturally as a result of those things growing. Can I just say that with peer-to-peer, -peer, one thing we have to be very mindful of is that it doesn't scale very well because of these information challenges that I've talked about. So we're coming into the point with peer-to-peer -peer networks where frauds are coming up, people are lying, all the same old stuff that happened with banking is happening with peer-to-peer -peer because to accelerate their business model, they're having to make the same sort of qualitative judgments and, balance, and take the same sort of balance sheet risk that the banks did. Great, I'm going to take the last round of questions, so yellow uh, tie. I'd like to um, just refute, um, sorry. Um, I'd like to just refute um, some of the points about this cartel and sort of this um, sort of, uh, monopolization of money, because if you look at the 19th century, prior to Peel's Banking Acts, we actually had competition in currency in Scotland. Banks were issuing them and so on. It was actually government stepping in and stopping that. There was no central bank in Scotland, there was in England, and in England they were failing, the banks largely were outside and failed. But, but, the, the, but the Scottish system was connected to the British system. Yeah, and but they, 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 they could improve it, it was more stable and so on. But I would also like to point out that we could actually be using that if we actually abolish legal tender laws. So that instead of just using your pound notes here, you could actually say you use euros, you could use sort of dollars, because then individuals can escape an inflating currency easily and quickly and go into something else. This is the problem where you've got state monopoly, state creation of monopoly, and it actually stops um, individuals being able to flee into a safer currency. Okay, so we've only really got time for um, short questions, can say. But we will. We will be <laughs> hanging around afterwards so we can get into some more discussions then. I'm just going to take uh, two, there's loads of hands now, so I'm just going to take two more and then we're going to get those striped shirts. Just to bring this home to everybody, you've all talked about the asset price bubble that we're, the asset price bubble that we're probably in. Um, could you quantify, say, in FTSE and house price terms, just where you think we might be heading if we don't do something about this fairly soon? Right, thank you. Uh, right, um, Professor Richard Werner of Southampton University coined the term quantitative easing, and uh, he says, in a nutshell, his argument is that everybody has implemented it wrongly and that quantitative easing, the creation of money, should go towards productive investments rather than speculation, which is what's happened. Uh, what's your comment on that? Thank you. Mine's I'm going to add one. Mine's one. Bitcoin. The thing is, it's Bitcoin. 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 Bitcoin, does that make all this irrelevant? Bitcoin doesn't make it irrelevant. Can I just, I'm Richard Jones, I'm an ICAW accountant whose office is just down the end of the canal. It's very interesting what Isabella said, because outside this bubble, within a two minute walk, is one of the most socially deprived uh, estates in not the UK, but the whole of what we're still calling Europe. It's very interesting what Isabella says. Most of that estate survives on credit unions, food vouchers, local food banks, and trading within charity gifts of um, <coughs> vouchers given to use in local. And, this is the third one of these I've been to, being an, an accountant. No one has ever bought the people who live in Ladywood, Claire Shorto constituents, within one of these debates. Thank you very much. Okay, very shortly, final question. Can you keep it concise? Yeah. I have a slightly old fashioned view that the government ultimately has to balance the books. Right. And I don't. I really get confused by this concept that you can have helicopter money and give everybody a cheque for, say, a thousand pounds. And that's very different. That doesn't count against the PSBR. But if the government gives a tax cut of a thousand pounds to everybody, that does count against the PSBR. So uh, please explain. Okay, so the questions were, and I'm going to ask the panellists to keep their answers possibly to like under a minute because we want to finish dead on 5.30 because people are going to use this space. Um, asset price bubbles, what are the dangers? Uh, Bitcoin, what do we think? Something about quantitative easing, uh, not going into productive se uh, sectors. 
What about people using vouchers down the road? How can they this discussion? Helicopter money, tax cut versus um, actual, like what's the difference between helicopter money and a tax cut? And I'm going to add a final question, which is what is the role of um, fiscal policy and monetary policy working together? Because if we're actually going to um, going to innovate in monetary policy, who's going to lead it? So who wants to kick off and I'm going to be really strict and keep you to under a minute. Thank you. Okay, we don't have to balance the books, right? because the, the pound notes that are in your wallet have been created out of nothing. That is a benefit the whole, the whole society can have. In my view, the Bank of England should be distributing that benefit equally to everybody. So even people on it shouldn't favour people who own stocks and shares, it shouldn't own people who have bonds, it shouldn't be in favour of banks, it should favour all adult citizens. Or, so all citizens should get an equal distribution of the money that we create for free, which we need to keep the economy going. In terms of asset prices, Bitcoin, don't worry about Bitcoin, don't worry about asset prices. The role of monetary policy is to stabilize spending. That's, that's its function, and we can do that through the distribution of the money that we create. And there was a final point about having private monies and what the Scottish did, etc. Absolutely not. Private languages don't work. Think about it. If I invent a language that only I speak, it's of no use to anybody. Uh, apart from myself, I can have a laugh of my own, that's fine. Um, that's where my jokes are funniest. However, language tends to one. And you would never give that power to another country. So you do not want to start using dollars or start using euros. And Scotland should be very aware of this. You don't want to start using uh, you know, euros similarly. So there's immense advantage in having your own currency, precisely because it is a gift to its own society. I agree with all that. And I'm sorry, but I've got to go. OK, thank you so much for being here. So um, on this point about the poor, for want of a better term, I, I do believe in the old idea of the ladder and the safety net, but the problem we've got at the moment, I believe, is that our monetary institutions mean that the ladder is broken and there are enormous holes in the safety net. I am outraged that there are still homeless people. I'm outraged, though there's a report I read over the summer, I'm outraged that we're in a position where if, if um, benefits were paid within three days, two thirds of food bank use would disappear. I mean, outrageous that we pay so much money to operate a welfare state that does that. I could give you a catalogue of in callous indifference to the suffering of the poor, which I've seen by the, amongst people operating the welfare state. And I don't doubt that they're lovely people in all other regards, but somehow, when we put this with the, 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 within this system of rules-based provision of welfare within the state, somehow it doesn't work in a way that I suspect that friendly societies would never tolerate. To Barry's point about abolishing legal tender laws, well, I actually I agree, and there's just a fundamental intellectual difference here about, well, basically because I'm a libertarian, I, and I, I want us to be free of the state as far as that's possible. But um, when Nigel Lawson was Chancellor, he basically adopted Hayek's proposal for competing monies and by, by saying instead of adopting the euro, we should allow Europe's fiat monies to compete across the territories. So, Barry, I agree with you. If I could say how big the bubble was, I'd probably also be able to say when it would burst, and then I'd be <laughs> remortgaging my home and short selling, and I just don't know. Um, and on this point about speculation versus investment, I'm afraid in a, in a society with uncertainty, all entrepreneurship necessary to production is itself speculative. So I think it's a bit of a false choice. Bitcoin, the problem with Bitcoin is it, because it is monetizing, its value fluctuates too wildly to be a good unit of account, and therefore at the moment it is not a good money. That said, I own some Bitcoin and I used it to buy an accessory for my camera, and it turned up just like it does from Amazon. So I think it's an exciting time to be alive in this space, and we should definitely not spoil the alert. For God's sake, whatever the government does, do not spoil Bitcoin and other fintechs capable of delivering a means of exchange which might be adequate should people choose to use it. Uh, I do think the books have to square. I think that it's a fallacy to suggest they can't. Um, but with respect to the free banking, uh, the QE point about productive investments, I couldn't agree more. I think this is where we are going wrong. And we should see QE targets, say renewable projects or something like that. Green QE is something I think is a good idea. And um, on the free banking stuff, well, the Scottish, the Scottish uh, example can be refuted by the, with the simple point that it was entirely guilt-backed, um, a guilt-backed system. And if it wasn't for the guilt that was supporting the, the, the Scottish free banking system, you wouldn't have had the uh, productive uh, stability that you had back then. Uh, there are lots of counter, there is a lot of counter literature, is what I'm going to just say. And on Bitcoin, 
Um, I will simply say that we're seeing this experiment provide us with a fantastic example of competing currencies. There's loads of them. There isn't just Bitcoin, there's Litecoin, there's yeah. Madeira, there's like a million billion different types of currency. And what we are discovering through this process is that there's a lot of fraud in this world. <laughs> and uh, almost all of these different uh, currencies are Ponzi schemes or scams to the degree that nobody can really trust them. And this is the kind of problem you would have in a free banking world, is that you'd have to do so much research before you accepted anybody's particular liability that before you knew it, your market opportunity would have disappeared because the guy who was selling you, I don't know, some jars would have moved on by now. So it's about due diligence. And in Bitcoin, we're actually seeing the system like mutate back into the current system. So who has the power in the Bitcoin economy? It's all the intermediaries, it's the coin bases and the sort of third parties who are um, essentially guaranteeing that your values, are, uh, your, your balances are kept at par, which is very ironic because that's exactly how banks came about because they too had different <coughs> fluctuating equity prices and they realized that people wanted a common currency, a common acceptable currency between all institutions and they effectively ended up cross-insuring each other so your liabilities would be you know backed by my assets so and so for the sake of the greater good and this is how we created the bank of england as it happens thank you wow well i think if we can all agree on anything it's that it's complicated um but thank you very much for being here and especially our panelists thank we've you. heard from steve about how uh, asset bubbles are being driven by monetary policy and that uh, monetary policy categorically is not working for society. Peter mentioned the that since financial financial crisis, banks have just not been creating enough money, which is why monetary policies had to become unconventional. Isabella talked about no one caring about ben no none of the financial markets wanting central bank reserves. They want the collateral that backs them. And she got in at the end that she promotes the idea of green quantitative easing. And Eric talked about the fact that central banks are in an intellectual crisis right now. They're out of tools. Um, so I just want to make a couple of announcements. If you, ha if you are interested in positive money ideas and our campaign on stopping QE and getting money created for people, not financial markets, please come and see Danny and you can sign up to our email list. There's a bunch more food, so please stay around and have, a food, have some food and a drink with us and carry on discussing this very complicated topic. Perhaps, uh, I think two people particularly, the panel generally ought, uh, ought to be honoured, but particularly I think Steve Baker for raising, or organising a part, the first parliamentary debate about this issue since 1844, two years ago. I, I think that's right, isn't it? <laughs> I don't quite agree with you about everything, but that was really great. And Fran for organising us. I think you've done a really super <laughs>